Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel where I talk about all things tech and finance. And in this video, I'll be going over the theory and applications of an autoencoder. Now, an autoencoder is essentially a fully connected neural network. And if you haven't already checked out my fully connected neural network uh, video, I highly recommend that you do so because an autoencoder essentially builds off of that logic. So I assume that you've already checked that out and you know what a fully connected neural network is. An autoencoder is an unsupervised learning method using supervised learning techniques. You are essentially trying to predict the input based on the encoder and decoder interpretations. There exist many different types of autoencoders. However, I'll just be focusing on the simplest one and with the simplest architecture since the rest of the architectures are inherently similar. They just use different mapping strategies. There are three main components of an autoencoder. The very first component is the encoding function. The second one is the decoding function. And the third, you just have some loss function that calculates the errors within your predictions and your given data. The encoded features are known as the latent variables or the bottleneck area, which is right in the middle. This is where the architecture is trying to extract the most important features of your data. And from this bottleneck area, you will then enter the decoding area where you where based on your feature extraction, the autoencoder is trying to stitch back together the components to re-engineer the inputs. You can use this method as a dimension reduction technique, or you can use this method to identify the most important features that exist within your data set. Inherently, their goals are shared by the two methods. There are striking similarities between principal component analysis and an autoencoder. In fact, if you just apply linear functions in your neural network and equate the number of bottleneck nodes to the number of features, you should have very similar results to that of a PCA model. The autoencoders and also the principal component analysis share many similarities, but they do have their differences. Starting off with the autoencoders, um, the autoencoders are able to model nonlinear functions, and it's very similar to PCA uh, in that if you just have one hidden layer, you will essentially have the exact same results or very similar results as the PCA analysis. The autoencoders can also be extremely time consuming since, after all, it is a neural network. And because they are neural networks, they are very prone to overfit. So you can always address this with regularization parameters, but you do have to keep that in mind. Lastly, the autoencoders are essentially like a black box algorithm. It's extremely hard to interpret the results of the autoencoder. You just have your results and you know that it works to an extent. The principal component analysis is constrained by linear functions. Uh, and is unable to learn nonlinear feature representations. And this is where the autoencoders come into play because inherently the autoencoders could answer questions that PCA inherently cannot. But PCA is also faster and cheaper than autoencoders, but it does get a little bit more computationally expensive if you have more and more features to play around with. And it usually underfits the data. And especially if the data is extremely complex or it's not linear by nature. And lastly, the PCA is extremely easier to interpret. So maybe you can even apply the outputs of the autoencoder, plug it into the PCA and interpret from there. Now I have a Python notebook all cleaned up and ready to be run. Note that pretty much the entire code base came from Keras.io building autoencoders in Keras. Um, they do a great explanation on how all of this is incorporated and uh, it would suck if I just had to recreate the wheel. So avoiding that mistake, I just essentially copied and pasted all of the code associated with building an autoencoder with some twists and some explanations along the way. But I want to make that clear that the code came from this link and the link is in the description. But First and foremost, just load in your packages. You have your TensorFlow, uh, you got your data sets. We will be working with the MNIST data set and we will be working with the input, dense and model uh, functions from the Keras library. And of course we just have our typical data science libraries over here. 
And then this is just loading in the data uh, where essentially we have the MNIST, uh, MNIST uh, splits for the X train and X test. It's, this is inherently related to the MNIST load data sets. Um, and since this is like a really popular notebook or really popular data, uh, they conveniently cleaned out the data and associated it with different types of variables or different parameters so then you can then go forth and test out your models. Over here, we're, they are just loading in the 32 floats or 32 bit values and they normalize it. And then from here, uh, we want to essentially flatten the data. This is where the flattening is occurring, where we just have the length, the number of observations essentially over here. And we just have uh, the two dimensions, 28 and 28 combined together in order to get everything into one input uh, in one input layer, so to say. So we would essentially have 784 uh, inputs to uh, play around with. And then this is where they're actually creating the architecture of the autoencoder. Uh, so we would have two parts to this. You have the encoded and you have the decoded. This is where you're trying to extract your most important features over here, just based on 784 nodes and you're gonna have 32 nodes that the 784 will shrink down to. So this is your bottleneck area. And up to that point, everything's being encoded. Transitioning from your bottleneck to your, essentially your very final layer, you just wanna make sure that the number of units is the exact same as your input, because based on my previous explanation, you, would, you are essentially predicting itself based on a squeeze version of the encoding on the actual inputs. And then you create your model, you have your summary, and then um, you incorporate your model together. We have your, both of your inputs and you plug it in. And this is where uh, your summary of your model exists. And then over here, since we already incorporated the autoencoder, uh, note that the loss function, which is your distance function, is a binary cross entropy. The binary cross entropy is essentially the sigmoid function plus cross entropy. That's all it really is. And then you can look it up as to what that equation entails, but that's what that loss function is doing. And I let this run for a little bit on the fit. I just put 100 epochs. It should be done over here. Yeah, 100 epochs and the X test and X test over here. Note that they are two of the exact same thing because it's testing on itself. Um, that's just coming from the original data set all the way up here from our loading X test X test. So yeah, that is fine. And then this is where the predictions are occurring, uh, in terms of the length, actually, let me just run that the length, we have 784 potential or this number of predictions, but we are only going to be running 10 of them just to see what it will look like. And this is the out actual output and we don't need this. And this is the actual output. And from here, the very first layer is the input. This is the second layer is the, all the, the pixelated forms. That is your encoding. So this is up to your bottleneck. And then your very last layer is your output, which is a representation of your input based on all the dimension reductions. So the main thing to take away when you are constructing your auto encoders, probably the most important part of the actual autoencoders is that if you want to make this more um, more complex, then you would essentially just start incorporating uh, many, many more layers. So instead of like, you know, having dense over here, you will just have, let's say 128 units, and then you would have 64, or you would have like another 256 over here, 256, 128 to 64. And then this is your bottleneck area. And then after your bottleneck area, you would be doing essentially the exact same thing where you will actually just be spreading out. So this over here, this will just be, let me just put this as 64 and this will then be 128. And then this will be 256 over here. 256 and then you have to change these inputs uh, from each other and like you can uh, well you associate like a1 is equal to here and then a1 you pass that into this one and then this is a2 
so on and so forth. That's A2, and then this would just be A3. And then you would just be passing an A3 here, then you pass the uncoded to the very next layer where this would just be B1 is equal to that. That, well, encoded, sorry. And then you have B2 is equal to B1, where that's essentially just the input that you are passing through. And then you have B3, where you're passing B2 toward. And then B3 will last be encoded over here. And then this will be your, your essentially your new neural network to play around with. Uh, but in essence, you want to be fanning down or fanning toward the bottleneck and then fanning out toward your output. That is essentially the architecture of an autoencoder. And note that there are a ton of other autoencoders, but everything is essentially inherently the same, but with some different types of mathematical procedures and different formulations on how to calculate or how to find your features, uh, your most important features to be exact. And of course, this will be running a little bit more, a little bit more slowly because it is a more complex model. Okay, so it seems like that has run. Uh, we can just run everything all over again, do some additional predictions, and then rerun the sizes. And oh, the nine was actually a little bit better, to my knowledge. I'd have to check on that. But yeah, this is the explanation as to what an autoencoder is and how you actually run it using the Keras library. It's short, it's simple, it's really easy to do. And if you have any questions, please let me know down in comments. Thank you everyone so much for watching and I hope to see you in the next video.